Now, as you said, you were in Antifa for four years and you were one of the organisers for it. So you are in uh, quite deep. But uh, how did the process begin? Because obviously, you know, you would have had, you know, very strong convictions during that time. How do you come to, you know, the realisation that everything that you've believed for a long time is wrong? Yeah, well, I, I mean, it was a slow process. I mean, it's a lot easier to learn this ideology than it is to unlearn it, right? And, you know, obviously what happens is your whole social dimension um, becomes, you know, these other radical left-wingers. So it becomes part of your social identity, which makes it harder to kind of change the way you think and see about the world. Plus your social media feed is constantly regurgitating these narratives. And, um, you know, that's something that, if there's any radical right wingers um, listening, I'd like them to maybe think about that themselves. And um, you know, so I was in this echo chamber, and um, yeah, for years and years. And I, I I I saw how cannibalistic and how nasty a lot of these people operated. But that said, there were some really nice, lovely people in this scene. You know, not everyone was an idiot. It's the problem is that the the nice people were so toothless. And so gutless that they could never stand up to the the pathological bullies in the cult, you know, and um, and so kind of I, what happened is I believe that the ideology was fine, and it was just that there were some bad people in the in the movement. There were just some bad eggs, right? And so you know I, I kicked around in this ideology, you know, for for a long time, and it was only. After I exposed myself to some critiques of the ideology, I mean, I mean how sort of feminism and uh, you know these narratives of, of white privilege or whatever reduce, reduce people to their group identity, and seeing the way that these uh, narratives would be abused by people, um, and uh, and so I, I sort of started to watch SJW cringe videos. Um, and I, I could start to see how the radical left mirrored the radical right in so many ways. And I I kind of started to make... I made this one video where I kind of tried to redeem and reform, I guess, the radical left. I was... Basically, my point was is that the whole PC culture um, is, you know, puritanical and, um, you know, focusing on the trivial rather than the sort of the main objectives and that that was alienating and stopping the, the movement from being able to grow. And, um, you know, I, I made a video called White Male Commits Microaggression. And um, in that video, I kind of, I critiqued this whole notion of white privilege. And I said, yes, on average, historically, white men have had it better. Um, and a lot of it destroys the individual. I mean, you know, and there's other major... Um, uh, measure privilege in, um, you know, and my point was that, you know, a, a lot of the uh, people who attended the Reclaim Australia rally, a lot of them were missing teeth. You know, what about tooth privilege? Um, and so that was sort of a point I made in this video. And so privately with other individuals in the radical left, I would have these conversations with them and they would agree. They would go, yes, it's, it's gone too far. It's puritanical. The identity politics is toxic. So I made this video and then the same individuals that agreed with me in private were publicly denouncing me viciously, viciously for daring to make this video, even though that I was an individual who was still going through court for parking a van to stop the Party for Freedom uh, in Sydney from being able to rally outside of a, a halal food expo. You know, I was going through court, literally, for this cause, and these other individuals weren't. You know, but yet they felt they had the moral superiority to viciously condemn me in public, agree with me in private. Like if they actually cared about me or, 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 or thought that I was wrong, they could have acted with reason. They had my mobile phone number. They could have called me up and go, hey, Shane, I disagree. Let's talk about it. No, they just wanted to savage me. And, um, and you know, this had been happening for a long time and it had happened to others. But that was kind of the last straw where I was like, you know what? You people are fucked. You people are, are, are toxic and you will create a worse society than the one that you think is evil and corrupt and oppressive. And that was sort of the, the final straw for me where I went, 
I'm out. I'm out. This this is nonsense. Of course, uh, changing your political views that's one thing, but then you know leaving an organisation like Antifa, which is you know cult like and which has consumed your life for uh, so long, that's uh, just as uh, just as hard to confront. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people who have been bullied and, and saw the nonsense in the radical left have chosen to um, just put their head down and rebuild their life and just avoid it. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a bit more outspoken and, um, and I, I, think it's, I think it's important for people to speak out against this and to, to fight back against this firing narrative of the fascist evil, anti-fire um, good. You know, I think, no, everyone's evil, everyone's ignorant, everyone's fucked, you know, and that's the heart of reality. But, yeah, I, I was willing to speak up against them because I think they're wrong. I think they're dangerous. I think that they fuel the radical right. I think their identity politics um, encourages people to become, uh, to try to go, oh, okay, well, we're white then, and that's our identity. Okay, we'll play that game then. I think that they've done a lot to encourage um, right-wing identity politics, and I think that the, the lack of willingness to debate and their stupid idea that even giving a platform for someone to say a different opinion contributes to the forces of oppression or whatever is wrong. I think that you have to go back to debating people. And, um, you know, I'll give you an example. Like years ago, there was a, a, a radical left winger who's a bit older and more mature. I mean, that's the other factor is that there's so much immaturity in these movements and, and personality disorders and stuff. But... You know, there's this guy who was a, a uni professor in, in Queensland and the Australia Defence League who kind of, you know, take the criticisms of Islam but then I think maybe go too far to the point where they're kind of, you know, maybe a bit unbalanced or whatever. That's my opinion. And then they, he went to one of their rallies and he had a conversation. By himself, he went to their rally, had a conversation with them, talked about, you know, his ideas and there was no violence um, they were like, okay, we can see your point, you know, um, and that, you know, maybe you, you're, there's some truth in what you're saying as much as that, you know, they probably felt there was truth in what they were saying. And then they went, then they left the situation without any violence. And you know what? The Australia Defence League didn't have any rallies after that for years afterwards, right? And I believe that the, the um, combative nature of going to, you know, smash the fast and trying to fight them is wrong. And I think maybe what, imagine how much better it would have been when the Reclaim Australia rallies happened if people were trying to engage in debate. And like, I'll be honest, obviously there are some people who attended the Reclaim Australia rally who have a just as pathological, just as dogmatic, just as maybe evil agenda uh, and that they're on the extreme ends of the radical right and they don't believe in debate and they, they want to see society destroyed or whatever, because they have the same malevolence in their soul as the radical left-wingers. But they weren't everyone at the Reclaim Australia rallies, you know? Like, uh, imagine if people... People need to... See, the problem is, is the left won't let people have to voice their concerns about Islam. People need to be able to say what they think and then engage in a dialogue, rather than going, no, you're a fucking evil, racist, bigoted for having that opinion, and now I'm, I, I have the full reign and... And, and yelling at you and shutting you down and doxing you and, and all this, all that just fuels the whole political divide and it pushes people to the extremes. And I just think, I just think that's toxic and it's wrong. Uh, obviously, like you, uh, you've done our show today. I've also seen you appear on a number of other uh, media channels. And of course you have your YouTube channel. Has speaking out been hard? Like, uh, which, uh, do you get threats, or uh, should, should I preface that by saying, like, any credible, you know, threats to to your safety? Yeah, I mean, there's radical left wingers who threaten to attack me, and um, all the time, and and uh, there's a lot of slander out there against me, um, and you know, they the radical left try and stop my gigs because I do, you know, stand up comedy, and um, you know, they they try and ring up venues, but. So the thing is, is that because when you're an ideologue, you kind of assume that everyone kind of has your values almost or whatever, and you think your ideas are more mainstream than they actually are. Um, and so a lot of the time, the promoters, well, all the time, the promoters just go, okay, mate, and they hang up, luckily. Um, but yeah, so they, they do try and attack my livelihood. 
um, and and they do threaten me physically. And um, you know, I will be down in, in Melbourne in the in the thick of it. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they tried to turn up to my events or or tried to assault me or whatever. But you know, I think any time they do that, they don't understand that they're, they're actually giving me uh, a bigger platform. And if they ever do assault me, and you know. Um, or whatever that that's going to give me much more attention and mileage because I'm not a right, radical right winger. I mean, you know, I, I, I believe on some policies, you know, I'm kind of right wing. But like, the difference between how I was in the now versus the way I was then is I have uncertainty. I don't know enough to decide what foreign policy should be, what domestic policy should be. I don't know. I don't fucking know. I don't understand enough about economics to, to say capitalism is good or, or social democracy is good or anarcho-syndicalism is good. I don't know, right? But I do know that th this this power struggle shit, this oppressor-oppressed dichotomy, this group identity stuff is wrong and that, that violence is wrong. Uh, and, and I'm... I'm... And now, obviously, uh, you st you've started off as a centre-right libertarian, then uh, went into Antifa, which is radically different, and now you're speaking out against them. Are you quite confident now that, you know, you would never uh, be one of those people who would, you know, drift back to uh, Antifa or any other type of uh, radical philosophy? No, because I, I, I feel that now that... I think that politics, politics is an extension of morality. And I think on some level, you know, we all have an existential crisis and we're looking for solutions and, and, and meaning in this life. But I don't think, I don't think the solution is to adopt these, these, these things that aren't even you, these ideologies, you know, I mean, what happens is like, you know, you kind of take one moral principle of, oh, war's wrong or whatever, and then, oh, sexism's wrong, and then you just... You, you get so close up into it that you're looking at the world like this, you know. And uh, the, the work that I want to do now is uh, I'm doing a comedy show about addiction and the war on drugs and stuff. And I do think that there's a relationship between morality and not that I think that people with addiction are immoral people or anything like that. But I do think that there's a relationship between morality and our ability to delay instant gratification. So the same, I, I think that the same parts of us that will you know, rationalize drinking too much or, or, you know, eating too much or whatever your addiction might be, gambling or whatever, or, you know, not, a, not everyone has these issues. Or even social media could be an addiction, you know, and, um, and that, that, that the same mechanisms that make us do that are also the same mechanisms that will make us lie, you know, lie out of convenience, you know, like a common experience that's maybe more subtle would be like a friend who's got food on their face. Maybe you don't want to tell them because you don't want to deal with that conflict and it's easier to lie or whatever. But ultimately, that's the lower moral path, right? Because he's going to embarrass himself. And then you scale up that principle in terms of telling the truth to yourself um, because, you know, you'll justify procrastinating. You'll, you'll lie to yourself. You go, oh, I'm not going to do that project that has meaning and purpose because um, I've got to take out the bins, you know. And, you know, I think a lot of these people will spiritually procrastinate. You know, I think that's what I was doing when I was this political ideologue. Oh, I don't need to worry about um, focusing on my own personal realm or my family life. What about the fucking wars, mate? That's more important. And, you know, you know, to some extension, I know that there's radical right-wingers who, you know, have gone out in the Lakemba and, they've, you know, tried, gone into fights with, like, Muslim people, whatever. They've ended up in jail for, like, six months. What, and th th these are people who have kids, you know, and these actions of like these moral narratives of oh, fighting against the the menacing Islamic threat. I mean, that results probably in their kids growing up being on a couch sometime in the future, telling a a doctor, uh, a psychologist, uh, how their dad missed their birthday party because he was fucking running around in Lakemba. You know, and I feel that these political ideologies can kind of allow us to spiritually procrastinate. Just like when I was talking about Karl Marx, um, you know, who was an alcoholic who neglected raising his children, he could justify that in the grand scheme of these great political narratives. So I, I don't, I don't see myself ever wanting to go into becoming a political ideologue, and I have to work out how I can get rid of my own inner corruption and and be a better family member and and to regulate my life better, so I'm less likely to. I mean, I bought a coffee today, 
Do you know what I mean? I mean, this. I know this weakens my cardiovascular system. It wastes my money, money that I could spend doing other things that would make my life more moral and, and bring me closer to my goals and my, my value systems. I mean, what, why the hell should I be telling other people how to live and opposing my value systems on other people when I can't even follow my own value systems? This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.